to elevate our own agenda above what might be the better for everybody and for others. Um, now I want to clarify when I talk about temptation, it's never a sin to be tempted. We are all tempted at times. The sin happens when we give in to that temptation and do things that we ought not do. Uh, take for instance, we can go back to the very beginning of this country and our very first president, George Washington. I don't know if you realize this. I didn't even realize it until as much until I really delved into it. But uh, back when uh, Washington was a general in the army, this nation probably came a lot closer than we may think to having a king rather than a president. And that's because the founding of the nation was a very rough process. It wasn't that easy. It wasn't like the pilgrims came over here, they set up a government, and everything was uh, just uh, fine and perfect all the way. Uh, historians uh, do uh, point out many, many mistakes were made along the way in the founding of this country. Uh, without getting into a big civics lesson, the republic form of government that we are, we are not what we call a true democracy where everybody votes. Uh, there's really no true democracy in the strictest sense of it. But a republic that we are, that has never been successful before in the, in the history of the world. We are the first to make it successful. The branches of government and that individual sovereign states, they were all vying for power in this very new nation that they had formed. And it was difficult at first to get everybody singing out of the same hymn book, as they say. Now, during the growing pains, the government was short on money, uh, the army wasn't being paid, and the problems continued from there. There was a man named Colonel Louis Nicola who served under General Washington, before he was president, of course. And Nicola and his colleagues one day wrote a letter to the General Washington, and they suggested, we just completely scrap this idea of a republic that you are trying to create here in the United States, and let's just reorganize the United States as a monarchy ruled by a king. They said that would provide more st stability for this new nation. And they weren't sure what would happen if they continued in this uh, new plan that they had, this path they had gone down. The fact that the army wasn't being paid probably had a good bit to do with it too. But uh, Nicola and his colleagues, they said, hey, not only should we have a king, 
General Washington, you should be our first king. Well, who today do you think would turn down the opportunity to be a king or a queen for the ladies out there? And uh, how many Americans do you think, if you poll them, say, hey, would you want to be king or queen of the United States? How many do you think would assume the role and accept it when you think of all the power that you could have? Uh, it's a lot of power to turn down. There are many laws on the books right now. If you were a king or a queen, we could get rid of all the individual states and we could have just one person at the head say how it's going to be. Uh, there are a lot of rules, laws, I should say specifically, that some of them make us scratch our heads. Others are very good laws, some eh, maybe not so much. Like uh, in Colorado, uh, it's illegal to collect rainwater in a bucket. Uh, stuff like that, if you were king or queen, you could get rid of that law, say that's just silly, you can collect all the rainwater you want for all I care. Uh, in Nevada, it's illegal for camels to be on the highway. I uh, don't know of any camels in Nevada, but maybe they're out there. If you think that law is an affront to the dignity of camels everywhere, you could get rid of that too, if you were king or queen. Or in Mobile, Alabama, it's actually illegal to throw confetti and shoot silly string. Uh, these are actual laws on the books, by the way. Again, not saying they're enforced at all, but you could get rid of that too, if you were king or queen. Now, going back to George Washington now, he responded to this letter suggesting he become a king and we become a monarchy uh, with his own letter. And just a little part of that letter, he says, if you have any regard for your country, any concern for yourself or posterity or respect for me, to banish these thoughts from your mind and never communicate as from yourself or anyone else a sentiment of like nature. So in case you didn't completely grasp what General Washington was saying in sort of archaic English language is uh, for the good of your own country, just don't even tell anyone that thought entered your mind. Uh, that's a very bad thought. It says a lot, I think, about George Washington, that he was willing to turn down the temptation to seize a great deal of power from the very beginning and he had in mind a greater good. In the Bible, we have a, sim a situation that is somewhat similar in many regards, and that's what we'll look at this morning. Last week, we looked at young David who defeated the giant Goliath, and a lot happens in these books of Samuel. A lot happens in the two chapters that follow. We're gonna skip over, uh, not because it's not important, just because you know, I don't want to be looking at the book of Samuel for the next 10 years. But David grows and he becomes a warrior and he is fighting alongside his king, King Saul. He's like the general, like General Washington in a sense. And it gets to the point where Washington's popularity starts to exceed that of his king. That makes King Saul jealous of David, and he gets to the point where he wants to do David harm. Meanwhile, the king, Saul, has a son named Jonathan, one of several sons. Jonathan's a very good friend of David. So Jonathan finds himself sort of caught between a rock and a hard place here. On the one hand, he knows he is obligated to serve the king who's his father, but on the other hand, he loves David as a brother, and he doesn't want to do him any wrong, and he knows what the right thing to do is. And uh, these uh, concepts and aspects are sort of at war with each other in Jonathan. So that's where we'll pick up the story in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 20. If you're following in your pew Bible, you'll find it on page 20, 206. And we'll read uh, from verse 1 through 17. Then David fled from Naoth to Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to take my life? Never, Jonathan replied, You're not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without confiding in me. Why would he hide this from me? It's not so. 
But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it for you. David said, Look, tomorrow is the new moon festival and I am supposed to dine with the king. But let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. And if your father misses me at all, tell him, David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole family. If he says very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure he is determined to harm me. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I am guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? Never, Jonathan said. If I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? David said, asked, who will tell me if your father answered you harshly? Come, Jonathan said, let's go out into the field. So they went there together. And Jonathan said to David, by the God, by the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father by this time, the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably dis disposed towards you, will I, send, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father is inclined to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. The chapter does continue much longer, and I would suggest reading that to see how things uh, happen. But Jonathan shows how he was willing to humbly follow the will of God, even when to do so, it meant giving up the promise for himself of great notoriety and fame and power. You see, like George Washington, who virtually had the crown handed to him but turned it down, Jonathan knew that according to the typical lines of succession, if his father, King Saul, dies, guess who gets to be king? The crown should be transferred to one of his sons, well, the oldest son, actually. So that would go to Jonathan, uh, who was the eldest uh, son. The problem is, though, that's not the way God planned this whole thing. You see, David had already been anointed by um, uh, anointed to be king by the prophet Samuel even before his incident with Goliath. So Jonathan now has a choice to make. Should he honor the will of God which doesn't give him the crown or should he pursue the crown which would be in accordance with man's law instead? And Jonathan realizes now this is David. This, this isn't just any, anybody out there. This is his best friend, a man that he loves. And he knows David, he knows David is a good guy, and he is a godly man. So when Jonathan weighs the scales, there's no contest at all. He chooses his friendship with David over any aspirations of ever having to crown himself. And David also knows that uh, Jonathan has something to gain if he would be out of the picture. David tests Jonathan here to see if he truly is honorable by suggesting, he said, Jonathan, don't wait for your father to kill me. You know, if you want me out of the picture, just kill me now. And that way I'll, I'll know where you stand here because I know that you have something to gain with me not being here. Every day we encounter a very similar test. Maybe not life and death, but everyone encounters uh, days of testing to see if we are like other people or if we really truly care for individuals. 
And I admit, I, I don't always and haven't always passed the test, but I know that with God's help, more and more so as I mature, I think I passed the test more than I used to back before, than before I was saved. So the question is, do people see the light of Jesus shine through all that we do? And uh, we, don't, uh, we don't even have to go and inform someone with words that I'm a Christian believer and that therefore I'm going to act this way. If the spirit is truly in us, then they should just automatically know there's something different about this individual. When we read a little further in Samuel, Jonathan and his father, the king, have a very serious argument around the dinner table, and Saul accuses John of being in league with the enemy. Sort of a natural response, knowing what we know about Saul now. Jonathan finally sees for himself that his father would indeed kill David if he ever had the opportunity. So let's try to again put ourselves in the shoes of Jonathan, knowing this. You know that your father hates your best friend and hates him enough that he wants to kill him because he feels threatened by him. Well, at first, Jonathan didn't want to think there's any way that my dad could think this about my best friend, but Saul quickly proves him wrong and reveals his hand. If you would go back and you don't have to now, maybe jot down the reference just a chapter prior in uh, chapter 19, verse 6. Saul told Jonathan these words, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. Well, the only thing that changed one chapter later is now Saul stopped lying about it. All along, he wanted David out of the picture. How do you think that made Jonathan feel? His father wants to kill his best friend. We just can't get past this idea. When you read on, you see the shouting match that takes place, and uh, the author of the book of Samuel tells us that Jonathan was irate at his father, very angry, and for good reason, because he was his father's just acting irrationally now. Later, Jonathan confides in David. He says, "Yes, I found out. Yeah, my father is out to get you. So you know, you better get out of here as soon as you can." And David flees. I, that's really the turning point, though. If they were making a movie about this, that is sort of the tearjerker scene because you have best friends being forced apart, uh, life or death situation, uh, sort of like a soap opera in a sense. And at the time, Jonathan and David didn't even know that they would only meet each other one more time this side of heaven after that point. But the good thing is Jonathan left no doubt in the mind of David where he stood. He did what he could to prove to David that his friendship came first and not the desire for the throne and not even the desires of his father that he uh, was sworn to protect. Their friendship, which was rooted in honoring God, was stronger than either of their personal gain. That's the kind of friendship Jesus Christ offers all of us. At least Jonathan didn't have to die at this time for the well-being of David. But Jesus, on the other hand, he died for each of us who would come to faith in him. In Jonathan's selfless love, we see a very strong picture of Jesus. Jonathan accepted that it was God's will that he would never be king even though it seemed like he should be the next one up from a human perspective. But David also was somewhat in a similar boat for the remainder of the time when we look from David's point of view now, uh, we already see that he had been anointed king of Israel uh, years, probably years ago at this point. And I think that most people wouldn't want to wait Hey, you, God, you anointed me king. You said I was going to be king. What are we waiting for here? Uh, you know, give me the crown. Let's get started. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just give me that power. Give me that throne. But that wasn't the case with David. It was like God saying to David, I have a plan for you. And I'm going to let you in on a little bit part of this plan. But not yet. And how, do, how do we like it when God does that to us? Well, 
maybe it's like you're in a dead-end job and you have the option that you can use your experience that you've gained at that job as a stepping stone for something better or to make the most of it. As far as David is concerned, he should start getting used to having to wait now because the day he killed Goliath wasn't the first day that he ever picked up a sling and a stone. Uh, he certainly had to practice to get good aim and literally, uh, for him to literally run towards the giant, sling the stone, and hit him in the head and kill him. Now the stakes were higher though, as he knew one day he would be king, but that was going to take further maturing. And apparently he would have to mature while being on the run from his current king which many of the next chapters detail those events. Now, none of us, I'm sure, have been in a situation where we've literally feared for our life, or I hope that's the case. But if we sort of generalize things, I think we can still apply this to where we are. Let's just say that when things don't go our way, what typically happens? Now, if you remain true to God and you don't mope around and sort of feel sorry for yourself, Hopefully, your character will improve and mature as a result. You don't walk around arrogantly like the world owes you something, and it's a way that God humbles his people. When you're humbled, you learn to depend on and trust God. As a fugitive, David was going to certainly have to learn to depend on God every single day. There was no more living in the king's palace without a care in the world. Such lavish living has the possibility of making a person soft. So some time in the real world was probably the prescription that David needed to toughen up and mature his character and learn to rely on God. God knew that David had what it took to be a better king than King Saul, the man that he says in the Bible he regretted that he made king. To mature, David simply had to be taken out of his comfort zone. And I would say that more often than not, if you don't feel like you're being tested, you may not be growing as much in the faith, and that's not a good thing. David grew because he didn't want to do what most men would do. David could have easily thought that since he was anointed king, why not stick around and have it out with Saul? Why not? Have a fight to the death. He could have done that if he wanted to. He could have said, if God's will for me is to become king, then God should protect me in a battle, allow me to kill him, and uh, you know I can have the throne then. That's the kind of thinking that people need to seriously avoid because there are different parts to God's will. There's the thing that he wills to happen, but there's also the means to that happening. See, God cares about both ends of it. There's many reasons why God didn't want David to assume the throne right at that time, not the least of which, as I mentioned, he probably wanted David to be a little more humble, a little less like King Saul, who he regretted he made king. And what is more humbling than to serve a king day in and day out that you know wants you dead? We know David was a deep thinker because he wrote many beautiful psalms that are pre preserved for us, and he pours out his heart in these psalms. And uh, uh, he, psalms are songs, so David really he is a songwriter too, an ancient songwriter. And I admire songwriters because they have a gift, and it takes intelligence to be able to compose a song. Maybe it's not the same intelligence as having book smarts and being able to remember miscellaneous facts and that kind of stuff. But it is an intelligence where you perceive emotions, then you see patterns of behavior, and you can describe all this in a very poetic form. David was able to do that. And I'm sure when he was on the run, he could see in his mind a picture of King Saul, the king he did not want to be like. And he was certain to go the extra mile to be an honorable king. When we think of being tempted and going outside of God's will, look at Jesus. Okay, Jesus in the Bible was tempted in the wilderness by Satan. 
Satan offered him all the kingdoms of the world if he would just worship him. Uh, Jesus knew that if he stuck to God's plan, no, he would rule all the kingdoms of the world. But the catch was including the cross. See, so Jesus could have taken the easy way out. He just, all he would have to do is just bow down one knee to the ground, maybe say a couple words to Satan, and uh, just for a brief moment, and hey, Satan had it planned out. This is the wilderness. There's nobody else around. Nobody's going to see, you know, just bow down once, you know, and uh, it'll all be over. Then you can have all this. That was the deal Satan was making him. And it's oftentimes the temptations that we face, too, to take the easy way out. Oftentimes, Satan, like with his situation with Jesus, he'll even provide cover sometimes. <clears throat> no one else will even know you did it. He wants to make it as easy as possible for us to disobey God. And it's so easy that you may not even feel convicted of it if you consider doing it, whatever the case is. Actually, I go so far as to say that if you never feel convicted because life is going so well for you and you never feel temptation, that's the time you might have to go back to God a little more because the Christian life is all about fending off these temptations. It could be maybe the enemy doesn't see you as a threat, so he doesn't tempt you very often. And uh, that's not a good place to be either. But Jesus was sold out to doing God's will. So he didn't take the easy way out, which was idolatry, which was worshiping Satan. Jesus experienced the temptations just like we do and just like David did. Jesus uh, knows how we feel, and he provides a way every single time to overcome the temptation through prayer and immersing yourself in God's word. And you see, Satan only tempted Jesus for a short period of time. Then he left, and the same goes for us. See, he has too much work to do to constantly be harassing any one individual. So he moves on to the next target, hoping that he'll have more success there. The faith that God instills in us takes us many places in life. Some people travel all around the world. David's faith took him on a voyage through the wilderness, a place he never wanted to go, chased by a madman who was his king. Question is, where is God's faith taking you? If you don't know what his will is, ask him and submit to him, and he should make that known to you, at least in part, maybe. Oftentimes, God doesn't show us the whole picture at once. Uh, for instance, back when I was taking my seminary classes, God didn't show me the whole picture. He just had me uh, register for class after class, put in the time, do the study. He didn't tell me what he had planned for me after graduation. And it was more or less a four-year process. There were ups and there were downs. But God never failed me, and I can see that looking back now. The story of David and Jonathan is truly a heartwarming story. It's a heart-wrenching story, too. Here in one chapter in the Bible, we get a glimpse of what a godly friendship looks like. We also get a glimpse of what it takes to follow God. And there's so much in this chapter we can learn about God because both men, uh, Jonathan and David, represent Jesus in different ways. The humility of John, Jonathan, is a picture of Jesus and the way Jesus knew he was royalty up in heaven, but he humbled himself to come to earth as a simple carpenter and do all the things that he had to do, be the perfect sacrifice for us. David is also a picture of Jesus because he knew God chose him for a very specific purpose, to be the king. Jesus is our king, even though he was unfairly persecuted as Saul was trying to kill him. This is the same way that Jesus was promised this kingdom of his own. But the Jewish leadership was doing all that they could 2,000 years ago to have him killed. Like David and Jonathan, we need to seek God in all that we do. Things won't always make sense and the devil is going to be on our back every step of the way. Uh, but remember that God honors faith and the, he honors the way that we exercise our faith uh, through Jesus Christ. 
Let's close out now with a word of prayer. Thank you.